Hello everyone and welcome to Baiju's Exam Prep IS. Today we are here to discuss the Hindu news analysis for 21st of March 2024. So let's first look at all the articles that we have for today's news analysis. First, the article that we have for detailed analysis. So there are three articles that we have here. One, eliminating diseases one region at a time. This is on your editorial page. On the mass kidnappings in Nigeria, this is one issue related to Boko Haram and everything that has been happening in Nigeria. And then don't use counselling to turn LGBTQ persons against their identity, says Supreme Court. So these are the three articles that we are going to discuss in today's lecture in detail. Apart from that, there are all these articles that we are going to discuss from prelims perspective. Why has Karnataka banned certain colouring agents? Now, this is something that we are going to discuss from the perspective of uh, the recent discussions that we have seen in Karnataka, in Tamil Nadu, etc. And then, slow and steady rise of mixed reality. So, we will discuss what is mixed reality. Then, BAML conducts test firing in, of indigenous 1500 horsepower engine for main battle tanks. So, we will discuss about that and what exactly are our main battle tanks. We will discuss that. And then, NASA craft that diverted space rock also dented it. So this is about the DART mission and we'll discuss about the DART mission and IMF to release 1.1 billion from bailout fund to Pakistan. Now this is again something that has been in discussion for a while so we'll discuss that. And then there are two articles that are ongoing discussions. So one with regard to the new newly appointment election commissioners and then apart from that our Prime Minister spoke to Putin and Zelensky. So what exactly that has been, we'll discuss that. So these are the articles that we are going to discuss in today's news analysis. Now the first one to start with is this article on your editorial page. Eliminating diseases one region at a time. Now what is this article? In this article, the author basically has been talking about how we need to ensure that we can eliminate the diseases that we have made certain programs for and what are the things that can be done what are the ways in which we can get to the required targets that we have set for ourselves so overall this article it starts with the carter center and how the carter center had reported a drastic reduction in the guinea world disease guinea worm disease uh, that we see that from approximately 3.5 million cases in 1986 across 21 countries now it has reduced to just 13 cases in 2023 and that to just in five countries marking 99.99 percent .99 decrease altogether now when it talks about this particular scenario the position that the guinea world worm, worm disease had potentially become we see that it in a manner you can say that now it is the second such disease to be eradicated following smallpox and after that we also see that at the same time we see that there is no aid that was taken uh, whether it is vaccines or medicines there was no aid that was taken it was largely driven by a lot of other efforts related to the eradication of the diseases now overall this is something when it comes to the near eradication of the guinea worm disease we see that it has heightened the global attention. It has focused, it has increased our focus on disease elimination altogether and how exactly elimination can be achieved. So overall what we have seen is that now we can also start focusing on some of the other diseases. For example, we can start focusing on malaria, tuberculosis, all the neglected tropical diseases and in all these cases we can try to align everything with the sustainable goal, sustainable development goals that we have set for 2030. Now overall when it comes to this, we also need to understand that there is a difference between what is elimination and eradication as the uh, article also mentions. So we'll discuss about that. What do we mean by elimination and eradication? Because many a times we use these words interchangeably. So we'll discuss about that, that what exactly do we need? Now overall what it says is, the article says that if we want to target the elimination of any particular disease, 
we have to first understand that how exactly can we aim for certain disease elimination. So for example, when it comes to the targeting of the disease elimination, it can actually also help in energizing public health systems. It can help in energizing public health systems. It can also help in enhancing the primary health care and at the same time it can also help in diagnostics and surveillance. So overall it can actually foster greater community and international support. At the same time it also generates very significant political, bureaucratic and public commitments as well. So there are all these things that we have to understand in the context of this article. And then apart from that, uh, it talks about certain challenges also, certain kind of strategic planning also that we might need. That despite all the benefits, disease elimination is a very resource incentive, uh, sorry, resource intensive effort and it can also strain the health systems. Potentially it can also start diverting the attention from, uh, to, from the other health priorities. And only it may so happen that we start coming away from the health priorities and we start focusing only and only on the diseases. So on only on these certain disease eliminations. So that's why it needs a very careful cost benefit analysis as well. And at the same time, it also needs political support because these two aspects, one being the cost benefit analysis. And the other one being political support. These two become very, very crucial. These two become very, very crucial in the context of ensuring that uh, we can choose the right disease to target for all the elimination efforts. So that's why these two things, they become very, very crucial. Now overall, when it comes to uh, the elimination of these diseases, we see that for any successful elimination effort, a very robust surveillance systems are also very necessary to ensure that we can detect every case alongside having very strengthened lab capacities as well and ensuring that all the uh, avail availability of treatments are there with us and we also have a lot of trained healthcare workers. So all these things become very very crucial in the entire system. So that's why if we want to attain, uh, attain this elimination, we need to understand that there are certain things that become very very crucial. One is with regard to surveillance, that the role that something like surveillance play, plays. All right. So surveillance actually will play a very, very important role. So we need to have a proper surveillance systems at place. At the same time, we need to ensure that this surveillance so that it we can detect every case. we should be able to detect every case and that's why surveillance becomes very very crucial. At the same time, we need to strengthen our lab capacities as well. We need to strengthen our lab capacities and then the training of the healthcare workers. The training of the healthcare workers, this also becomes a very crucial aspect of uh, looking at the eliminations that we need to get. So overall continuous surveillance and uh, even after elimination becomes very very crucial. In the post elimination era or the phase where that is also where we need to keep on surveying and we need to ensure that uh, already we are always keeping an eye on if there are any new cases or any new suspected cases at all. And that's why all these things will be very very important and vital to prevent any reintroduction of the disease. So that's why all these things become very crucial in the context of achieving elimination. So that's why we need to understand that achieving elimination nationwide may not be feasible for all the disease within the set time frames. That's why we are so talking about that we need to do the cost benefit analysis and choose the ones that we really need to focus on right now. So for example, certain diseases uh, that we have, for example, Kala Azar, and lymphatic filariasis, we see that in these are the cases where they are the ones they can be specifically eliminated in certain specific areas of the country because there are only limited number of states where they actually are 
prevalent and that's why we need to ensure that we include surveillance, vector control and drug administration only to these regions because they are endemic to certain regions only. So that's why we need to choose and prioritize We need to choose and prioritize the diseases that we want to eliminate first and then perhaps move forward. So that's why here we see that we need to ensure that all these disease elimination efforts, they can move very effective uh, in a very effective manner and they can become manageable at a regional level. And that's why here we need contribution from both the central government and the state government. Both are going to play a very, very important role in managing the disease spread across the states and the borders. So that's why the role of states and the central government. So they have to play a very, very important role in starting to achieve regional elimination. regional elimination so that regional el elimination becomes very very crucial in this regard and that's why we need to ensure that there are joint efforts by both the center as well as the state now one disease that has been mentioned in this article is about the guinea worm disease now this is a disease that is largely caused by a nematode now nematode basically is a long worm and if this picture for you is gruesome, sorry for that. But we, we basically know that this guinea worm disease is basically caused by a nematode. So now when it comes to this nematode, we see that this actually might be the one that can cause this disease. It becomes a waterborne disease and historically we have seen that it has been seen to be widespread in the parts of Africa and Asia. So it's a waterborne disease, waterborne. So the meaning of waterborne disease is that it spreads through water, spreads through water. There are some of the other very common waterborne diseases. Can you tell me the names of two or three very, very commonly found waterborne diseases in India which spread through contaminated water? Tell me in the comments. Now, apart from that, what we know about this guinea worm disease is that it is largely seen in the parts of historically in the parts of Africa and Asia Africa and Asia and we see that overall the life cycle of the guinea worm is closely tied with the water sources which are contaminated and overall we see that there are certain vectors that can cause uh, the spread of this particular disease and overall when it comes to the infection of this disease we see that uh, when let's say somebody ingests contaminated water which has water fleas etc so these uh, water or coke pots if you know so water fleas water fleas become very important vectors or also called as the coke pots so they become the carrier they become the vector and they will be the one which will, uh, they actually will be infected with the larva of this particular nematode. And once this nematode is inside the human body, the stomach uh, acid digests the water fleas. And this is something that releases the guinea worm larva into the body. And then they start to multiply and it may not show any effect for a very long time. All right. It may not show any effect for a very long time. It only starts showing effect when uh, the female larva are born and a lot of multiplication of these larva happen. And this is where we see that they start becoming infected, uh, infectious and they can cause a lot of issues there. And it, although it's not fatal, but this is an, an infection that can be very painful for the people who are infected. And the problem is that uh, all the symptoms they start showing only maybe after a year after you have already been infected uh, with this nematode. So that's why we need to understand all these aspects with regard to the guinea worm disease. Now, <clears throat> this article also talks about two concepts, one of elimination and one of eradication. So let's try to understand first how do we differentiate between these two terms? Because many a times you will see that these terms are uh, used interchangeably. Sometimes elimination of a disease, sometimes eradication of the disease. Are both the terms same or are they different? 
they are different. So let's try to understand what the difference is. So when we say elimination, elimination, the meaning of elimination is the reduction of a disease to maybe zero or when it, so reduction to zero of the in incidences of the specified disease in a defined geographical area as a result of deliberate efforts. Now overall when it comes to elimination of a disease what we see is that even after we have been able to uh, reduce we have been able to reduce the number of cases to zero in a certain region even after that we need very continuous efforts interventions are required measures are required to ensure that there is no re-establishment of the transmission so any re-establishment so we need to take precautions to prevent re-establishment in case of elimination. So that's why this is something that needs to be done. At the same time, we see that when we look at elimination, it is very area specific, meaning that a disease can be eliminated from a particular region or a country, but at the same time, it can exist in other parts of the world. All right. So that's why it is when we say elimination, elimination is largely about eliminating from a certain area only. All right. Eliminating from a certain area. That's why defined geographical area. That's why they might still exist in other parts of the world. And this is where we see that there are a lot of surveillances and uh, maintenance required so that we can ensure that there is no risk of reintroduction in other areas of this particular disease. So for example, let's say when you speak of polio. So polio has been eliminated in many parts, many countries, including India. So that's why they, although they continue to have an effect on populations in some of the other regions. Now, when we say eradication, the meaning of eradication is the permanent reduction to zero of the worldwide incidences of the infection. So that's why when we say that something has been eradicated, we mean that it has been completely taken away from the world. So that's why geographical scope wise will say that it is global in its nature, implying that the disease is completely removed from all the countries in the world. And that's why once it has been done, we probably will not need any further intervention. All right. So no further intervention. No further intervention required. So this is when we'll say that something has been eradicated. Example being smallpox. So in case of smallpox, you can say that now smallpox has been eradicated from the world. So smallpox has been eradicated from the world, whereas in case of polio, we know that polio has been eliminated from India. All right. So that's the basic difference in the scientific way, in the technical way, when we talk about these two terms of elimination versus eradication. And this is where uh, the article also talks about the Carter Center, which actually is a not-for-profit not for profit organization that was uh, established by the former US President Jimmy Carter and his wife alongside him. So they had started this uh, uh, center and basically to look after all the different aspects of human suffering, whether it is about global health or promoting uh, various aspects of human rights, etc. So they are the ones who are also looking after certain diseases that are found in various different parts of the world. Now in this context, one more thing that you should know is about the different elimination programs that we have had in India. So in India, we see that there have been various programs that we have run so that we can eradicate these diseases from India. And that's why many a times when these terms eradications are being used, eradication still may not be a proper word to use because we are still talking about only India. Eradication is supposed to be a much wider term. So for example, we have the polio eradication program so that we could eradicate polio from India, although it should have been eliminate polio from India. Now, in the same way, when we look at the strategy, there we saw that there was massive immunization campaigns that was run in India. Uh, and you might know it as the Pulse Polio Program, right? You might have heard of the Pulse Polio Program. So now this Pulse Polio Program, this basically um, has led to the elimination of polio from India. And in 2014, India was declared polio free. 
So that's why that has been a very significant outcome of the Pulse Polio program. And then after that, we see that there has been revised National Tuberculosis Control Program as well. And in this regard, we are looking at a target year of next year, that is 2025. And this is basically to control and eventually eliminate the TB cases from India. And this is where we have seen that we have used a lot of different methods. For example, uh, direct treatments have been used and there are dots. If you know about the dots strategy that are being used, uh, that is direct observed treatment short course. So dots in terms of tuberculosis is very, very important. That is direct observed treatment short course strategy. Now this has been one of the most important ways in which we have been trying to fight the TB cases in India. Apart from that, a very strong surveillance system also has been built in India to ensure that we can eliminate tuberculosis from India. And that's why we have a target year of 2025, which is ahead of the global target that uh, UN has kept. Then there is the National Vector Bond Disease Control Program. So this basically was mainly about the vector borne diseases like malaria or dengue or chikungunya or encephalitis or uh, filariasis. So all these kind of uh, diseases that are related to some kind of vector, some kind of vector. So that's why this basically is where we are looking at this. So that's where diseases like malaria, diseases like malaria, diseases like dengue, all these are the ones that are being discussed or that we have been targeting through this. Now this is where we see that there are various control measures being taken, uh, surveillances are being done and there are free treatments also being given to the people who are suffering in these contexts. So that's why we see that overall when it comes to the outcome and the target that we have, the target that we have kept for some of these has been 2030. That by 2030 we want to eliminate some of these diseases and overall for malaria we have kept this target and for uh, lymphatic, uh, lymphatic filariasis also we have kept this target. So there are all these targets that we have. Similarly for leprosy. So there for leprosy also we have had national leprosy eradication program. Now this has been a program to eliminate leprosy as a public health problem. Now when it comes to the cases of leprosy, one thing that you should know is that why leprosy especially has been very very crucial for India because one of the data says that 60% of all the cases, 60% of all the cases of uh, leprosy in the world are in India. So that's why it becomes very crucial, especially for India to ensure that we can eliminate leprosy because India has the largest burden of leprosy in the world, almost 60% of the cases. So that's why we have seen that there has been significant progress in this program as well. We have been able to uh, decrease the numbers uh, a lot. There have been a multi-drug approach that has been used. Now vaccines are now also available. So there are multiple approaches that we are using in this regard. Similarly, we ran a very successful national AIDS control program as well, where we have seen that we have been able to uh, decrease the number of AIDS cases in India. And there was wide... Uh, educational program, prevention and care program that were run and we ensured that there were counseling and testing services which were available widely in India. So overall we have seen that there has been a decrease in the prevalent cases of HIV in India. So that becomes very crucial from this perspective. And then lastly we also now are targeting Kala Azar. So in case of Kala Azar elimination we see that this uh, has been defined as uh, where we are trying to reduce the annual incidences to less than one case per 10,000 people at a sub-district level, all right? So the ratio we want is, should be less than one is to 10,000 at sub-district level. At sub-district level. So this is what we have been targeting in this regard of Kala Azar and we see that there also because it's an endemic disease only found in certain parts of India in mainly in the Gangetic Plains. So that's why we have been targeting these areas and trying to ensure that we can eliminate these diseases from India. So that's why just know about all these programs because these are the programs that widely have been running and we have been targeting them. Now coming to the second article that is on page number 12 and this is on the mass kidnappings in Nigeria. 
Now, in this regard, when we talk about this article, there are certain things that have been mentioned in this article with regard to what is happening in Nigeria. Nigeria, we know that it has been grappling with its worst economic downturns in years. And alongside, we have seen that a lot of security challenges also have escalated in this region. And where we see that a lot of new cases or rather resurgence of kidnapping cases have started happening in the northern regions of the country. Now overall what we see is that since late February, one of the data says that since late February, there have been over 600 individuals which includes at least 300 school children who have been kidnapped in the northeastern and northwestern western parts of Nigeria. Now overall when it comes to uh, the mass abductions, we have seen that this is not the first time that these kind of issues have happened. In late February, we saw that Boko Haram militants, they were suspected to have abducted at least 200 internally displaced persons of Borno. Now, apart from that, we see that there were 287 students, 287 students who were kidnapped uh, from a school in Kaduna states. And that is also where they demanded for a ransom of approximately $600,000. So this has been uh, and all that that's why one of the reasons that we are giving is that because there has been significant economic downturn in Nigeria that might be one of the basic reasons why a sudden resurgence has been seen. And shortly after we also see that there were 15 children who were abducted from the Sokoto state uh, in, the, in a boarding school. So overall, all these have been happening, 100 individuals kidnapped in two separate attacks in Kaduna. So there have been all these cases of problems that we have observed. And this is where we see that there has been international condemnation of this, that the human, uh, UN Human Rights Commission, Commissioner for, had condemned the kidnappings and he called for accountability to address the impunity that has fueled for all these incidences. Now, apart from that, what we know is that there have been all these cases, similar cases back in the day as well, that in 2021 and 2014 also, we saw that there were certain issues like that, where we saw that Chibok girls abduction case happened, which has been one of the worst cases of human crisis that we have seen in the recent past, where there were almost, I mean, out of all the girls who were abducted, there are 98 who are still missing even after a decade of them being missing. So one of the most unfortunate cases of human uh, <coughs> crisis has been seen in Nigeria. Now apart from that we see that overall we uh, see that it has been attributed largely to Boko Haram but at the same time there are other groups also that have now emerged and probably there are others also which are involved apart from Boko Haram in this particular case. Now overall uh, the reasons that have been given that it might have been driven by a lot of economic strife that we see right now in uh, Nigeria, in unemployment rates rising, inflation rates rising, food insecurity and political instability, all these also can be reasons, all these are supporting reasons which has started causing the resurface, resurfacing of all these. Now overall what we have seen is that the president of Nigeria, he has refused to pay any ransom for any of the recent abductions that have happened. And there was a law, interestingly there has been a law uh, in 2022 which imposes a minimum 15 years in jail for anyone who is paying ransoms. Now the government is focusing on security operations also to rescue the victims and also has been advised uh, to also has been advised to engage in the dialogue with all these bandits or these militant groups so that we can resolve this human crisis. Now overall here uh, we need to also understand some of the uh, problems of this region. We are talking about this exact part which has been uh, fo uh, focused upon and overall when it comes to Boko Haram, Boko Haram has been actually, sorry, Boko Haram has been uh, there, they have been active in this particular area, the area that we call as the Lake Chad area which basically has all these nations bordering it. So Boko Haram, if we go into the understanding of what Boko Haram has been, 
Boko Haram has been is a terrorist organization which largely has been in the northeastern parts of Nigeria but at the same time it also has been active in Chad, in Niger and also in the northern parts of Cameroon. So that's why we are talking about this particular area because that is where they have been largely active. So that's why we are saying that they have been active in the northeastern parts of Nigeria. right? They have been active in the northeastern parts of Nigeria. So these parts of Nigeria and you can say that in a manner this is the region where they have been active a lot. Now overall when it comes to this particular group Boko Haram we see that they are a group they uh, who were actually this group actually was founded back in 2002 and it was founded by Muhammad Yusuf and initially it was a group which was focused on opposing the western education and uh, so in back when we talk about the early phase between 2002 to 2008 between 2002 to 2008 we see that it was founded in 2002 and Muhammad Yusuf was the one who had founded it and then initially they were focusing mainly about they were about opposing western education and they claimed that uh, it is corrupting uh, the Muslim values or Muslim moral values in the country and that's why the name Boko Haram was given that western education is forbidden in a manner so this is loosely I mean you can say that loosely it translates to this that western education western education right western education is forbidden loosely you would say that it can translate to this now this is where it starts from where they are opposing western education in the early activities so in the early activities uh, there are we do not see any terrorist activities in the early parts of their operation they were preaching against the nigerian government's corruption and advocating for the implementation of the sharia law in nigeria but after that when the death of Yusuf, Muhammad Yusuf happened in police custody back in 2009. All of a sudden we see that this group that until now was looking at a lot of preaching and doing a lot of preaching against Western education and the corruption in Nigeria etc. and imposition of Sharia law all that. But at the same time now what we see is that after his death in 2009 they all of a sudden they start becoming violent. They increasingly become violent now and then we see that there is a, a, a new leader that starts emerging uh, Abu Bakr Sheku and in under the leadership of Abu Bakr uh, Sheku we see that this is where the organization started launching large scale insurgent attacks as well against the government institutions first security forces but also civilians and that is where it starts to uh, become a terrorist organization because we see that uh, especially in 2014 this specific case that we are talking about in 2014 they came you can say in international limelight when they abducted 276 school girls from Chibok and this is something that also out um, had sparked global outrage in this particular scenario and we see that after that uh, the group's uh, activities have resulted in tens of thousands of deaths that has happened in this region widespread destruction has happened displacement of millions of people has happened because of this and it significantly has contributed to humanitarian crisis in this entire region of the lake chad basin so overall that's why we have seen that this now has been a big problem altogether and that's why we are talking about all these activities in this regard and uh, unfortunately when we look at this incident of 2014 out of these 276 school girls who were abducted 98 of them are still missing uh, a lot of these school girls they were also uh, they they died a lot of them also faced physical abuse and there are uh, sexual abuse and unfortunately the way has uh, the lives haven't been the same since then and overall what we see is that after that uh, they also start showing their allegiance to the Islamic State back in 2015 
and that is where we see that they also start uh, making another group. There is another group that emerges called as the Islamic State West African Province. So this Islamic State West African Province, it emerges in 2015 and we see that despite all the military efforts that have been taken by Nigeria or all the no neighboring countries in that particular area to combat Boko Haram, we still see that this group continues to uh, pose a severe threat to the region's security and stability and there have been a lot of different uh, terrorist activities that they have been involved in. Now, when we look at the actions of what has been done against them, what are the various responses that we have seen? Response-wise, we see that first there have been, uh, from the perspective of the uh, Nigerian government, there have been military campaigns that they have run. There are significant military campaigns, several operations that have been run to try and dismantle the operations of Boko Haram and their strongholds, trying to rescue the hostages, trying to restore the peace in all the affected regions. But at the same time, these operations, they have been seen, uh, they haven't seen a lot of success. Uh, we see that there have been significant territorial gains that have been made against the groups in certain periods, but uh, they have been uh, very mixed. Their response have been very mixed. So that's why one thing is that we see that there has been military action that has been taken by the government of Nigeria. And there have been certain counter-terrorism legislations also that have been brought in. Uh, there have been uh, laws to try and curb the terror financing and try to enhance the legal framework for also prosecuting all the suspected terrorists in these kind of areas. Similarly, there have been other programs. For example, there is a program called as Operation Safe Corridor. All right? Operation, Operation Safe Corridor. Now this Operation Safe Corridor, it basically aims to rehabilitate and reintegrate the former Boko Haram fighters who have voluntarily surrendered. And that's why we are trying to also de-radicalize, they are trying to de-radicalize uh, de and trying to uh, educate them as well further so that they can get away from these kind of activities. So, so that's why there are all these things that the Nigerian government has done. Similarly, there have been regional cooperations as well. We have seen that there has been multinational joint task force as well. So this multinational joint task force, this largely was uh, 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 made by all these countries which are in this particular area. So, so there has been multinational, multinational joint task force, multinational joint task force and this is something that was largely established by certain countries like Nigeria, Chad, Cameroon, Niger, Benin, all these five countries they came together. So all these five countries they came together. So Nigeria, Niger, Chad, Cameroon and Benin. These five countries they came together to form a multinational task force. All right. So joint multinational task force. So which are the countries? You have Nigeria, you have Nigeria, you have Niger, Chad, Cameroon and at the same time we see that we also have uh, Benin. So Cameroon and Benin. So these are the five countries that have formed the joint task force and that's why they are coordinating with all the military operations which are required across the borders to fight Boko Haram and not only Boko Haram but also uh, the other terrorist groups that have been found in this particular area. So overall we see that there is this and there has been a Lake Chad Basin Commission also that has been put in so that they can also try to ensure and understand the root causes of insurgency, uh, for example poverty or unemployment etc. And through development projects probably we can actually try and solve these issues. So that is basically where we see that Lake Chad Basin Commission also becomes important. So Lake Chad Basin Commission. So this also becomes crucial in this regard. And then there has been some international support as well. We have seen that military and logistics support has been given by 
various different countries like the United States, France, UK, European Union as a whole. They've all tried to provide all the military training and equipment and logistical support to the Nigerian government to try and help them fight against Boko Haram. At the same time, a lot of humanitarian aid also has been given by international organizations and countries where they have been trying to ensure that uh, humanitarian uh, aid can be provided to especially the people who have been displaced because of this crisis in Nigeria. So by providing them food, by providing them medical care, to provide them shelter, especially to all the uh, affected populations. So that's why we see that there are all these cooperations internationally as well to try and solve for these kind of issues. Now, coming to the third article, don't use counselling to turn LGBTQ persons against their identity, says Supreme Court. Now, what exactly are we saying in this and what are the certain, certain things that have been discussed in this article? Now, the Supreme Court basically has warned against the use, uh, use of court-ordered counselling to change the identities and try to change the sexual orientation of the LGBTQ plus community members. Now, overall, when it comes to this, basically there was a three bunch, uh, three bench, uh, uh, three judge bench that was led by our Chief Justice D Y Chandrachur, and it emphasized on the importance of respecting individuals' identity and sexual orientation without trying to alter them through counselling. Now, what was stressed upon? was the fact that we need to ensure that we avoid imposing on their imposing their personal values over the constitutional protections and that's why the verdict uh, that has been provided this verdict basically provided guidelines for handling of the habeas corpus uh, petitions and also the uh, protection pleas by the lgbtq individuals urging the judges to demonstrate empathy to demonstrate empathy and at the same time also try to disregard any kind of social biases that they might have and that's why when it comes to this particular case that actually came from a petition that was filed by a woman in Kerala and this was about her same sex partner where we see that the Kerala High Court had ordered counseling that led to the partner uh, choosing to stay with her parents and she said that she is going to focus on her career instead of uh, going back to her partner. Now, in this particular regard, we see that there are certain cases uh, that have come into the picture and there are certain issues that have come into the picture that needs to be addressed very well. And that's why it was highlighted that we need to recognize uh, the importance of chosen family sometimes over the natal family as well, over the blood relations as well. That one should have an option to also choose where they want to be, what, where they are comfortable. So that is something that needs to be understood. So here we are talking about counselling. Now when we talk about this counselling, counselling basically is the process that is intended to provide the guidance or psychological support. And typically it is uh, done by professionals uh, in, uh, in social work, in psychology or in all the related works. But in the context of this article, the Supreme Court has ex uh, expressed the concern that the uh, over the use of uh, all the court-ordered counselings that have been done for the members of the LGBTQ plus community in a manner that could potentially aim to alter uh, their identity. So that's why this type of counselling as has been criticised by the Supreme Court may be completely, you can say, misapplied under the judicial orders in these kind of cases and that's why here it might lead to distress in these uh, uh, people from the community and that's why it needs to be addressed well. So that's why court had cautioned against the use of certain counselling like this as a means to influence uh, certain individuals of the LGBTQ plus community. So overall that is basically what it is talking about that we need to ensure that all the constitutional values of in, uh, individual autonomy and dignity have to be ensured rather than imposing the social biases upon them. So this is basically what has been spoken of. Now we need to understand some of the way forwards here with regard to what the Supreme Court said. The Supreme Court basically talked about the respect for autonomy and identity. Supreme Court emphasized that there is an importance 
uh, it emphasized on the importance of the of respecting the individual's identity and sexual orientation and also highlighted that the judicial processes should not attempt to change these inherent aspects of a person and when it comes to this, this becomes very, very crucial for us to also understand uh, and value the individual identities, whether it is with regard to their social uh, status or whether it is with regard to their sexual orientation. This is, these are not the things or especially with sexual orientation is not something that you can change. You cannot counsel somebody into changing their social, uh, in, into their uh, changing their sexual orientation so that needs to be understood that there yes there is a social stigma but somebody who is sitting at a judicial position needs to rise above that social stigma and has to work in a constitutional manner and that's why the judges have been urged to demonstrate empathy and compassion and avoid any kind of influence of social biases or whether these are uh, homophobic or transphobic views in their rulings at the same time, they also have been encouraged to ensure that their personal prejudice does not come uh, in the view of or in the way of the constitutional values. So that's why all these things become very, very crucial. And that's why uh, there have been guidelines for handling of these cases that have been given, that uh, they have laid out specific guidelines for the courts in dealing with these kind of petitions and the pleas that protect from... Uh, that protect the LGBTQ plus individuals and that's why these guidelines they aim to ensure that all the laws that we have they respect and protect the free will and rights of individuals without any undue interference from family or the societal pressures and that's why it is also very very important to recognize the importance of chosen families in these kind of cases and this is a word that has been mentioned in uh, the ruling as well chosen family so chosen family uh, especially for the lgbtq plus persons uh, underscoring the significance of the relationships that are formed outside of the biological ties that a person has that the recognition is very very crucial for providing support and safety nets for individuals who are facing some kind of discrimination or violence from their natal families from their blood relations so that's why in this regard education and awareness becomes very very crucial that it's not uh, something uh, that was explicitly mentioned in this article or in this ruling but at the same time when we look at a broader implication of the way forward you can say that uh, the need for education and awareness about the lgbtq rights and the issues that this community faces that also needs to be understood in the judiciary as well and of course at society at large but for the safeguards of uh, constitution it becomes very very crucial and that's why it is something that can help in reducing all the prejudice uh, that we have uh, in this regard and also to ensure more informed and empathetic handling of all the related cases in these kind of scenarios so that's why uh, in a manner we perhaps also need monitoring and review that implementation of these guidelines and there are broader impact on judiciary's treatment of LGBTQ plus communities. Uh, these kind of issues might require ongoing monitoring and also we need to review the uh, uh, all these uh, proceedings right now to ensure that there is the that we ensure that there is a respect and protection being provided to uh, the community against any kind of discrimination that they might face so that's why these are the things that we need to understand as a way forward for what these issues have been uh, highlighted in this article now let's look at some of the articles related to the prelims examination so on page 13 we have this article the slow and steady rise of mixed reality uh, now in this case mixed reality when we are talking about mixed reality here uh, what we basically are talking about is a combination a combination uh, of mixed real combination of vr and ar now in this regard uh, this article mentions something related to the company apple and how this company has come up with a new pair of headsets where they have been specially talking about it calling it as spatial computers all right they have been talking about it as spatial spatial computer 
now the word spatial computer is very widely highlighted all right it's very widely highlighted and now when we look at this uh, spatial computer what we understand is that this uh, becomes very crucial also from the perspective that although they are talking about something which is called as mixed reality they are talking about something called as mixed reality but they have been mentioning this as spatial computers so what is mixed reality let's try to understand this now this article actually talks about a brief history also of all these things that have happened and how exactly do we look at uh, what happened in 1960s 70s 90s etc for us all these things are not really important but what is important is when it comes to the these kind of headsets that have been introduced by them now what are these in uh, headsets and he exactly how exactly they do they work these are the things that we need to understand because the way it has been introduced is that it is a complete revolution it's a complete revolution compared to uh, all the things that are available in the market until now and it has been priced if you know this it ha they have been priced at almost 3500 so why 3500 for these uh, headsets so overall when it comes to this uh, the article basically has been discussing the apple's introduction of something called as vision pro now this vision pro the branding that has been done is like it is a revolutionary spatial computer so so when we talk about this vision pro which is supposed to be a revolutionary spatial computer instead of a commonly term that is used in this regard called as mixed reality so how are these different because in an effort to redefine the narrative redefine the narrative it has actually uh, instructed the developers to refer their apps as spatial computing apps rather than using the terms like virtual reality augmented reality or mixed reality so what exactly this uh, is and uh, what exactly do we understand here so understand this that what do we mean by mixed reality so mixed reality basically is a blend of physical and the digital worlds which is creating a new environment where physical and the digital objects both of them can come together they can coexist and they can interact in real time and that's why it merges two very very important components which are called as virtual reality and augmented reality virtual reality and augmented reality and that's why they would be able to create experiences where the digital and the physical objects can interact with one another and that's why unlike virtual reality or vr which tries to immerse uh, users completely into a digital environment or ar which tries to overlay the digital information all to the real world all right so this is so when it comes to virtual reality what do we see in virtual reality we see that the users completely get immersed in a digital environment all right so this is basically what we see so it immerses users to digital reality all right to digital reality or digital environment you can say and in case of augmented reality what do we see in case of augmented reality we try to overlay the digital information onto the real world all right we try to overlay the digital environment digital environment onto the real world so unlike all these uh, vr and ar what we see is that when it comes to mr or mixed reality it tries to bring together the best of both the worlds in terms of technology so that's why in mixed reality the users can actually see and interact with the real world while simultaneously also seeing and interacting with the virtual environment as well and that's why this interaction can achieve that it can be achieved through uh, a lot of devices where you have these mixed reality headsets or what apple calls that as uh, uh, spatial computers so that is where we see that they actually can help in interacting with both the worlds and when it comes to the applications of mixed reality also understand the applications beyond the headset we see that they can be used in educational purposes where its students can interact with three dimensional models of maybe historical artifacts uh, so that's why they can be useful in education they can be useful in education similarly they can be useful in 
हेल्थ केयर दे कैन बी यूजफुल इन हेल्थ केयर बिकॉज इन केस ऑफ हेल्थ केयर ऑल्सो वी कैन एक्चुअली यूज दैम फॉर एनहेंस्ड सर्जिकल प्रोसीजर्स और ऑल्सो ट्रेनिंग विद द हेल्प ऑफ वर्चुअल सिम्यूलेशन and at the same time in manufacturing and design as well it can be used where we can allow for real time collaboration and virtualization of designs in a very physical space so that's why we see that there are uh, a lot of things that can be done so in uh, uh, in in product designs also we see that it can actually be used so in that's why in manufacturing in manufacturing and design in manufacturing and design also they can be used and then after that we see that they also can be used in gaming also in uh, storytelling experiences as well so that's why they actually are a very significant step forward in how we interact with technology and that's why they offer very innovative ways in which we can learn we can work we can play and we can connect so we have to see how the things move forward apart from the virtual reality or oh sorry mixed reality headsets that we right now have in in terms of the vision pro that has been introduced by apple now coming to page number 16 gs3 article beml conducts test firing of indigenous 1500 horsepower engine for main battery tanks now what exactly are we saying here we are talking about some of the important points here that for the first time a uh, uh, test firing of india's indigenous 1500 horsepower engine for main battle tanks was successfully conducted at uh, BAML's Mysuru complex now this event actually was introduced by everyone uh, related to defense and at the same time we see that this is something which is very significant advancement in military propulsion at the same time we see that it can it features a very high power to weight ratio and operability under very extreme conditions such as in high altitudes they can be used at sub zero temperatures they can be used in desert environments they can be used so that's why they become very crucial uh, in uh, the uh, environments of our uh, battles and then at the same time we see that it has been given a lot of state of the art technology and it is where now we say that it is at par with some of the global engines that are out there and that's why it we see that this is something that was hailed as transport transformative development for the armed force capabilities so overall what we see is that this is something a project that was initiated back in 2020 and this was systematically divided into five major milestones to ensure that we can achieve the quality standards required now here we are talking about main battle tanks what do we mean by main battle uh, main battle tank so it becomes a very powerful heavily armed and highly mobile tank that can be used and becomes the backbone of modern ground warfare now in this regard when we look at uh, the mbts mbts actually can are capable of engaging the enemy forces and also it can fortify the positions and other tanks with high efficiency now when it comes to the battle tanks or the main battle tanks there are several main battle tanks in india also so you might know about certain main battle tanks the one of the most important ones here has been the arjun main battle tanks now when it comes to arjun in, it became india's first indigenously developed main battle tank and it was introduced in the service in the early 2000s now overall we see that there are very advanced features that have been used here uh, whether it's uh, their gun or the armor protection that has been provided and it also has a very powerful horsepower uh, a very powerful engine with almost 1400 horsepower engine so overall we have seen that there although there have been a lot of operational challenges and criticisms with regard to its weight and logistics with arjun mail battle tank so uh, because it also took a lot of time for us to come out with arjun main battle tank it took a lot of time so mark 1 uh, first we had arjun mark 1 and then arjun mark 2 Uh, which was an upgraded version of the original arjun uh, battle tank and a lot of improvements in armors or in fire power and in mobility as well at the same time a lot of advanced technologies also have been inducted into arjun uh, main battle tank mark 2 then after that there has been t90 bhishma or t90s bhishma rather so t90s bhishma 
So this also has been one of the most important battle tanks and overall when we look at India's uh, armed forces, this becomes very very crucial. Now this P90S is something that was actually procured from Russia and then it was manufactured in India uh, under the license that was provided. So overall we see that there are very highly sophisticated firepower systems that we have here and at the same time it also has uh, a very strong explosive reactive armor as well and we see that it becomes one of the most balanced of the firepower um, capabilities that India has. Then after that another one if you want to know the another one has been uh, T-72 uh, Ajay. T-72 Ajay also has been one of the uh, main battle tanks and this also was uh, originally from the Soviet Union but after that extensively we have seen that we have uh, upgraded them and at the same time we see that a lot of uh, ammunition related, night fight capability related all these kind of capabilities have been given and uh, when it comes to T-72 Mark I, it remains one of the critical components of India's armed brigades. Now, overall, uh, apart from that, even in when we look at the future, there is a futuristic main battle tank also in discussion. A futuristic main battle tank, uh, which is also under development right now, you can say, that India has been trying to explore the development of the next generation main battle tank to eventually try and replace all the older tanks that are in service and this is expected to have a lot of better technologies in firepower, in protection, in mobility, in crew abilities etc. So overall we see that there are all these things that we have been doing to ensure that all these main battle tanks can function in the ground uh, realities during a battle. Then this article on page 18, IMF to release 1.1 billion from bailout fund to Pakistan. Now, in this regard, uh, when we talk about this uh, particular article, what we understand is that this is an article related to the bailout uh, that the IMF has pledged for Pakistan. And we see that there have been, uh, there have been significant ways in which we have seen in the, uh, in the past how exactly uh, IMF first has been in talks with Pakistan for quite a while. So initially, as you can see, that Pakistan and the International Monetary Fund reached a preliminary agreement for release of 1.1 billion from the 3 billion bailout following days long talks in Islamabad. Now when it comes to this we see that uh, this is a discussion that has been happening for a while now and uh, it's not a discussion which is a new discussion altogether because we see that this, these discussions have been happening uh, for quite some time because we have seen that in the past few years Pakistan has seen one of its most severe economic crisis that it had seen and that's why we talk about a lot of pro problems that Pakistan has been facing and how uh, some of these problems also have some kind of impact on India sometimes positive and sometimes negative as well so we need to understand that India also faces uh, you can say uh, India also will see some effect of whatever happens in Pakistan because we also talk about the fact that for example that terror fundings in Pakistan have dried up because of the economic problems that they have been facing. The economic downturn that Pakistan has faced that also has led to a lot less uh, engagement of the army and a lot less engagement of uh, their supported terrorist groups in India in the regions of Jammu and Kashmir. So we see that there is an indirect relation with Pakistan's economy with all these kind of efforts when the economies have dried up when the funding uh, in Pakistan has dried up but now what we see is that there is a bailout that uh, IMF had pledged and this is where the things are right now and this is where probably uh, when it comes to this bailout this can become uh, something that can have uh, an effect on India as well because it might lead to certain issues that India might face because of this bailout. So we need to see how exactly it goes and goes forward and what are the implications that uh, we have in the context of this bailout. So that's why this needs to be understood from that perspective. Then one article on the science page that we have is NASA craft that diverted space rock also dented it. 
Now this basically talks about the DART mission. All right. Uh, this article basically talks about the DART mission, and in this particular, when it comes to this DART mission, understand the importance of this DART mission. Now, uh, in case of this DART mission, what we have seen is that this was a mission. Let me. So this was a mission that was launched by NASA, and this mission basically was an impact mission on one of the moons of uh, an asteroid. So. Didymos and Dimorphos. They actually have been in the news because of that. So when it comes to the DART mission, it stands for Double Asteroid Redirection Test DART. Now this basically is a mission that was conducted by NASA and it was the first ever mission, first ever test of something called as Kinetic Impactor Technique. Got it? Kinetic Impactor technique so kinetic impactor technique to change the course of an asteroid in space now this was launched in november 2021 and this mission basically aims to demonstrate the feasibility of the of deflecting an asteroid by directly impacting it with a spacecraft now this is where the method that we are using here is basically something so that it can also help in planetary defense in the future that suppose that there is an asteroid an incoming asteroid threat that the earth has then these kind of missions and the learning from these missions can help us in uh, securing the earth from these kind of problems or these kind of situations so that's why the target of this dart mission was dimorphos so dimorphos basically is a moonlet we say that it is a moonlet of a binary asteroid system called as Didymos. So, so as you can see that this is basically what has been done. That there was an original orbit this, and as the DART mission went and tried to impact on it, uh, tried to collide with it. This is where it diverted it into a new orbit. So this basically is the DART mission. So overall, this is exactly what we have seen. And this Di Dimorphos basically was chosen because it orbits a larger asteroid, Didymos, and that's why it allowed the scientists to accurately measure the changes that happen in the um, the course of this particular moonlet uh, caused by this impact. And this uh, spacecraft, it actually went and impacted Dimorphos in 2022. I think September. 2022 and that's why we see that we see that we were able to achieve the required target so the primary goal basically was to slightly alter the orbit of dimorphos around didymos so that basically is what we wanted to check and we wanted to check how exactly this kinetic impactor technique works in this particular scenario and that's why it has been a successful mission in demonstrating that it is possible to change the path of a celestial body through human intervention. So this basically is what DART mission has been. Now let's look at a couple of uh, revisited highlights that we have here. Now overall when it comes to these highlights, what we see is that uh, this also has been uh, in, these are the topics that have been in the news and they have been very often in the news so that's why we need to understand how exactly the things are folding up. Now overall the first article that we have is that in Supreme Court center defense appointment of new election commissions commissioners ahead of Lok Sabha polls. Now overall what exactly are we discussing here? Now overall what we have seen is that there have been controversies around uh, that have been around the selection of the new election commissioners uh, that have been appointed by the uh, by the central government so on march 9 we see that arun goel who was a uh, election commissioner he resigned he tendered his resignation that resulted in an unexpected second vacancy so there was another vacancy that had happened a couple of months back and now we see that there was a second vacancy that happened so out of the three member team that you have of election commission where you have the chief election commissioner and then you have two other election commissioners. So the two other election commissioners, they actually, they resigned, all right? They now have resigned one by one and that's when now the entire election commission only has one member who is the chief election commissioner. So now this is basically what we see uh, after the events that unfolded on March 9th. And then after that, on March 14th, we saw that the selection committee had recommended two names 
and then finally we saw that the president also gave approval for the appointment of these two uh, election commissions commissioners so this basically happened and following that on march 15th we see that sukhbir singh sandhu and gyanesh kumar they started taking charge as the new election commissioners as a part of the election commission so now election commission has three people again uh, you have the chief election commissioner and apart from the chief election commissioner you have the two other election commissioners who are going to run the election commission now when it comes to this article why this article is important also in the context of what has been happening because we see that the center actually uh, was responding to all the allegations that were there with regard to the uh, this um, appointment that the center basically defended the appointment of these two election commissioners sukhbir singh sandhu and gyanesh kumar to the supreme court and it stated that it was very necessary to fill the constitutional duty to conduct the elections on time and these appointments were although criticized because it happened accordingly i mean to according to the critics that it happened in haste and it happened in an opaque manner but uh, what we see is that in this case uh, a petition by the association for democratic reforms had challenged the chief, new chief election commissioners and uh, the election commissioners act also of 2023 arguing that it gave the government a uh, a uh, 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 a do dominant role in the appointment process and also in ensure uh, in in the countering in countering some of the supreme court orders that were previously given now the center argued that the independence of election commission does not depend on having a judicial member in the selection committee and it refuted the notion that the fact that a senior government officials in the committee would always lead to a bias so you cannot say that if you have somebody from judiciary there will be no bias and when you have somebody from the government there will be a bias is what the center stated and it also stated that including the chief justice in the selection panel was a temporary measure until, until the parliament enacted a law regarding the election commissioner appointments now the government also emphasized that the, there was an urgency to fill the position to announce the election schedule also on time and that's why the center uh, center also addressed uh, all the criticisms about the transparency of the appointment process and the selection commission committee's deliberations as well where specifically they countered the claim that was made by adhir ranjan choudhury about being uninformed on the uh, about the candidate details and as has been told by the center that he was also given the information in advance so it was not that he was not given the uh, Uh, information in advance as has been claimed by him now let's look at the last article for today pm speaks to putin zelensky calls for dialogue diplomacy to end war now again this is something related to the russia ukraine ongoing crisis and where we see that there has been uh, a call that was made by our prime minister narendra modi and he con congratulated Vladimir Putin on his election victory and reiterated India's support for peaceful resolution uh, also in this particular manner and here we see that Zelensky also has invited India to participate in the peace summit that is supposed to happen in Switzerland and at the same time uh, the Ukrainian foreign minister he uh, Kubela he also is expected to visit India very soon so discussions actually included uh, Uh, a lot of international issues particularly concerning ukraine and also uh, a continuation of the coordination in the multinational format such as let's say whether shanghai cooperation organization or the brics etc and that's why both india and russia they have expressed satisfaction over the development of their strategic partnership and particularly in the forms of trade or in investment in energy in transport etc so this is basically where we see that india is trying to have a balanced approach between india and russia and trying to maintain uh, its non partisanship in this particular regard and has asked for uh, end of uh, this conflict as soon as possible so now one more article that we have today is with regard to why has karnataka banned certain coloring agents now this also is a continuation because this is something that we had discussed uh, on march 16th also on 16th march also we had had a discussion on the same uh, topic 
and we see that overall there have been uh, a lot of issues with regard to a particular coloring agent and when it comes to the particular coloring agent it is called as rhodamine B and this rhodamine B is what is in discussion altogether. Now overall there are a lot of samples that were collected from various food articles where rhodamine B is actually present. So and this uh, and then on that regard we see that it uh, they also did a test on a lot of food samples where possibly rhodamine B can be used. So uh, especially when it comes to rhodamine B this is where we see that all that has been done and overall when it comes to the Food Safety and Standards Act of 2006 it mandates that no artificial coloring agents uh, should be used in the preparation of food articles and this is where we see that it has been limited only to colors uh, where it has been approved already. So that's why we see that especially it was in context of cotton candy and gobi manchurian uh, where we found that the harmful rhodamine B was seen to be used as uh, a coloring agent in these uh, food articles and at the same time we see that overall we will see that besides gobi manchurian there would be other food uh, products also for example kebabs will also come under scanner now because that also is where uh, a lot of these things are actually being used. Now coming to the main questions for today these are the two questions first critically examine the strategies employed by India in eradication and control of communicable diseases evaluate the challenges faced in these eradication efforts and suggest measures for improving the effectiveness of such programs in achieving the sustainable development goals related to health. So again we discuss about some of the problems we discuss about some of the programs so apart from these programs what are the other initiatives and what are the things that at citizen level also can be done all these things can be written in this question and second discuss the role of judiciary in balancing traditional societal values with constitutional rights of the LGBTQ communities. So this is where we have to talk about the issues of the LGBTQ plus communities and what are the basic issues that they have been facing and how we also need certain areas of introspect and we need to have a way forward that can look towards their solving their issues and especially looking towards all the discrimination that happens against this community specifically. So these are the things that we had to discuss in today's lecture. I hope this lecture has been beneficial for you. Thank you very much for being here.